Hello and welcome to another episode of The Power of Story and Science. I'm your host, David Odie, and it's a pleasure to be back after a little bit of a hiatus that was somewhat unplanned. Uh, but that's not relevant now. What is relevant is that we're going to have what promises to be a fascinating conversation with a gentleman I've met recently named Mark Hirschberg. Mark, you want to say a quick hello? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me on the show today. Well, thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your story and what you've been doing since we made each other's, uh, well, not since we made each other's acquaintance, but we did that recently and, and just really hit it off and realized we had uh, interests in common. So uh, keeping in mind that the theme of the show is how people who are technical experts can do a better job with telling the story of their work. Mark, tell us your story a little bit. What's your origin story? What brought you here to what we're talking about today? I came here unexpectedly when I think back to when I first left the university system. I graduated MIT with multiple degrees and started out in the dot-com industry. I realized I wanted to become a CTO, a chief technology officer, the person in charge of all the software engineers. But to get that job, it wasn't just about being the best engineer. It wasn't solving the problems the fastest. There were all sorts of other skills I would need to get that job leadership, communications, team building, networking, negotiating. No one ever taught me these skills. There were no courses on that back at MIT. So I had to develop those skills in myself. Now, as I began this journey, I quickly realized these skills are not just for executives. They are for all of us at all levels. And I realized that by upskilling my team, we would all be better off. So I began to train up my team in these skills and not just myself. As I was doing so, MIT had been doing some surveys and found these are the skills companies are asking for over and over. And we've seen this for decades. So MIT wanted to address this. And we create a program now referred to as MIT's Career Success Accelerator. When they were putting together the program, I reached out and said, hey, I've got some content I developed for my team. I'm happy to share it with you. Please use it. Hopefully it's helpful. I thought that would be it. But instead, they said, why don't you come help us create more content? So I got involved creating some content. And they said, why don't you help us teach it? Because while we have these great professors, we don't have a lot of practitioners. So for the past 20 plus years, in addition to my career building tech startups, helping Fortune 500s play startup, doing it full time, doing it as a consultant, I've in parallel been teaching at MIT and elsewhere developing these skills in the next generation of students, and these days also inside corporations. And then I turn that into the Career Toolkit book and the app and other corresponding work, all about teaching these skills to people so we can be more successful in our careers. Be more successful in our careers, of course, because the, the skills that will help someone become a, uh, a mark, have marketable skills and being a bench scientist or being a, a first level engineer are not necessarily the skills you were talking about in leadership, communication, networking, et cetera. Um, so you, you say you figured that out and, and it sounds like you were kind of self-taught in those areas. Was there someone in particular who helped you along that journey? I was mostly self-taught because back then we didn't have a great podcast like this. There weren't as many books. The internet was still, particularly the web, was still relatively small, not as much content. So I did find some books. I was lucky to have some really great managers early on. For example, John Christensen, who is my first boss outside of academia, I remember watching him at the whiteboard. Now, this seems like a very small thing. I noticed his whiteboard diagrams were really good. And most people, when they go up to the whiteboard, say, oh, I'm just going to start drawing, and they draw in the middle of the board. But he was a lot more intentional. I would watch him and see what was he doing. And so I learned from him a few things. When I walk up to the board, I think, what will the final diagram look like? So do I want to start in the middle? Do I want to start on the left side? Maybe I put the current system on the left and the new proposal on the right. Will I have to do a lot of additional annotation? So do I need to leave room for that? Let me think about colors. Most people pick up a marker and that's it. And they use that one marker. Well, I have different colors. What can I express with these colors? Old is in one color, new is in another, or an alternative in yet another. And so just by taking a little extra time 
right before I start drawing on the whiteboard, I can be much more effective in that. And that's the type of thing I learned by seeing other people who did it well and then watching, learning, and imitating. Watching, learning, and imitating. And it took your observational skills to notice, here's somebody doing something different from what most people I've seen would do in that situation. And so this person's being so intentional in what they're doing, I'm going to be intentional in, in modeling that or, or taking that as a model and imitating that. Um, and I think that's such a, uh, such a keen insight. You know, here we are uh, just a few minutes into the program, and I think you've already given my audience members some, some great tips to think about. You know, keep an eye out for who is being intentional in areas that you know that you could improve in. And uh, be careful what you pick up next time you walk up to the whiteboard. <laughs> One of the things I do is a little bit of stand-up comedy. Now, I do that for fun. I do it to challenge myself. And I'm fortunate that I do it with a group of other comedians, some professional, some amateur, and we work on our jokes together and we'll help each other. But one of the things we also do is we look at other comedians. And this is something they teach young comedians. Who do you admire? What do you admire? Because we know there's different styles. Think about the comedians you know. Who do you like? What is it you like about them? Some are more physical. Some just have incredible timing. Some know how to take a joke and just keep hitting on that joke and just extending it out for more laughs. And by looking at what they do and really breaking down the joke and understanding what do they do here? Why did they do that pause? Why was it that long, that short? Comedy, by the way, unlike public speaking, you have to nail it down to the millisecond. Mm -hmm. Every pause makes a difference. Mm -hmm. The emphasis on one syllable versus another or changing a word from two to three syllables makes a difference. We know in public speaking, we tell you don't over-engineer your talk like that. It needs to be natural. <laughs> That's but stand right. Up, you have to have it all done. So we look and refine. And really, you can do that not just for your comedy, but whether you see someone on a whiteboard, whether you hear someone give a speech, look at what she does and think, okay, she's really great. Okay, but why? Why do I think she's great? What is it that she's doing is it her timing? Is it her enunciation? Is it her graphics? And really break down and analyze. I know most of the speakers here are scientists and engineers, so we're very good at saying, hey, it's working or it's not working. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Use those skills in your communication development. Use those skills. Ask why. Use your observational skills. What a, uh, as I said, what a key insight for, for this audience. Um, tell me a little bit more about um, the, the people you have helped to teach at MIT, what they went on to do, how you saw them benefiting from the program you helped develop? I've been teaching undergrads at MIT and they have gone on to every field imaginable. Some are scientists, some engineers. We have entrepreneurs, some who have created multi-billion dollar companies. We have people in all different fields. We have people outside of traditional STEM, even in finance, in consulting. Some have gone on to non-STEM fields like marketing or sales. So it's really been across the board, but all of us benefit by stronger communication skills. And let me give you an example why. This comes from my friend, Professor Charles Leiserson. I love this example. We're gonna do a little bit of math, but I know that's gonna work really well with this audience. <laughs> go back to middle school. Imagine you have a rectangle that's four by 10. You need to increase one of the sides by two units to maximize the area. Now, if you need to pause the podcast, feel free, <laughs> but I suspect this audience does not. Right. You immediately know the answer is go from four to six, 60 units. Okay, great. Let's think, what does that mean conceptually? When you put the two units on the short side, what you're doing is amplifying that by the long side, by the 10 units. If we put the two units on the long side, it's only amplified by the four for eight additional units. All of us have short sides and long sides, more than two, but we're using two for the analogy. <laughs> of course. So imagine you are a deep technical expert. You probably don't have to imagine that's most of the people here, you've got that really long side. You're extremely knowledgeable in some area. Now we know we have to keep up with that. In my field, for example, in software, 
if I wasn't paying attention, I'd be using technologies that are totally out of date. So I have to keep up on that long side. But if my short side was communications, if I didn't communicate well, if I was ineffective, and whether that means my public speaking or my emails, or just can I coherently express something to a non-technical person? Mm -hmm. There's more than one way you can look at communications. It's really mm -hmm. more than one dimension. But however you look at it, you have a really short side, you are long and thin. You have a small area. By putting a little time into our communication ability, and I'm not talking about now you're ready for that TED stage, now you're gonna get a million views, it's writing more concise emails or being able to explain something with less technical jargon that non-engineers or scientists can follow. Whatever it means in your case, going from that four to six, the effort you put forth gives you a better ROI. We increase your area much better. And so all of us need to recognize while we keep going on our long sides, putting a little effort onto our short side. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're already focused on doing that with your communication <laughs> side. Right. Gives us a much better ROI and will make us more effective overall. So if you think about the area and you're an excellent analogy, I hadn't heard that before, being your overall effectiveness. And what you're saying is that investing in the area that's your that represents your short side is going to have much greater impact on that overall effectiveness. What an interesting exactly. analogy. I like that. You know, I often, because of my own physics and engineering training, I often approach problems uh, from the standpoint of you know the area under the curve, so to speak. How do you how do you maximize the area under the curve? And you can change the, the size of it or the shape of it in various ways. But your, your rectangle analogy is so easy to visualize. Thank you for that. So what advice would you give to someone who's saying, well, this all sounds great, but I know I've got a pretty long, skinny rectangle. Where do I start? How do I find the most effective place to start adding units to my short side? First is to look at the type of communication you do, because you might never be up on that TED Talk stage or any stage, and that's fine. But you communicate when you sit around the conference table with your coworkers. And are you communicating just to other people in your department, other people with your technical knowledge? Or do you find in the role you're in now or the role you're trying to get, you're gonna spend a lot more time communicating with others. As I moved up in my career, I'm spending less time just talking to the engineers I manage and more times talking to the head of finance, the head of marketing, the head of sales. And I can't just use technical terms that all my engineers understand. I have to communicate differently. And so understand what's the type of communication. Are you writing more emails? Are you doing more PowerPoint presentations because of the nature of your role? So first look at the type of communication that provides the most value. And I'd say start there. Now, the second thing you should do is understand how to think about communications in general. No matter what you're doing, no matter the media, public speaking, emails, hallway conversations, it's important to recognize there are different mental models that we carry around. So we're gonna do a very simple analogy. Imagine I'm going off to France, I have to do a talk in Paris. Okay. I unfortunately, don't speak French. So I'm going to have to <laughs> okay. speak in English. That means everyone in the audience who hopefully speaks English in their head, they're going to have to take the English, translate it in their head into French, and then consider the idea. They have to spend a little bit of mental energy, a tax focused on the translation instead of just the message. I think of it like a CPU. You're saying, well, 10% of the CPU is for the encoding of the message and 90% is for actually processing what it does. Mm -hmm. So I just lost some of my processing power. Right. It would be better if I could speak French and then there's no tax. 100% of their focus can be on what the message is and trying to sell them on the idea. That's what we want to achieve. Now, it's not that we're speaking to French speakers or Chinese speakers but we do speak with different mental models. We tend to be very left-brained. I'm assuming most of the audience probably is extremely left-brained. Probably so. Think, 
Think about if you were doing a presentation to an extreme left brain person. I always think of Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory. If <laughs> right. you had to pitch your idea, what would you do? It'd be a PowerPoint and it would have points and sub points and be super hyper logical and organized. If you wanted to pitch that same idea to an extreme right brain person, someone who's big picture and I don't have time for the details and, and I want to interact with them emotionally, you don't give them a detailed PowerPoint presentation with points and subpoints. You choose a different approach. If you give them the wrong approach, it's like speaking the wrong language and they have to pay that mental tax to translate it into a way that resonates with how they think. So just as I would love any country I go to, if I could instantly speak their language, I'm more effective. By looking at who my audience is, whether a single person or a large group, if I can speak in their communication style, I am going to resonate with them and they're more receptive to my message and not paying that tax. That's right. That's right. Speak in their style. Uh, this is why something that I come back to over and over again in, in, my, in my books and in my speaking and in this podcast is the need to understand your audience. It's, it's got to start with the audience. And, and that's where I think so many people go wrong with technical presentations. They think they've got to start with the information. They think they've got to start with those diagrams and bullet points and, and charts and graphs. And if you don't start with the, with, by asking the question, who is my audience and what do they need from me? Then to use your terms, that audience is going to end up paying a heavy tax. There's even stylistically how people like to get information. If you think about an academic talk, it begins with, well, here's the premise. Here's what we were thinking. And so we set up this experiment and here's how we designed it. And then here's the data and the analysis and what we found. And now the conclusion at the end of the hour. My sales team, they don't have an hour to figure out and how'd you get here? With no. my sales team, it's, hey everyone, this is what we need to do. I'm gonna explain why in a moment, but remember this. Okay, this is why. I don't give them all the details, just maybe a few key things to convince them or to back it up or give them more details. Okay, so just a reminder, this is why. There's an old expression, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. Oh, yeah. And I'm not saying you always do that model, but that's very different than the academic model. And recognizing right. here's two styles, and of course there's more than two, don't use the wrong style. Because if you did that second, that business style in the academic presentation, they go, whoa, wait, wait, where's all the data? Where's yeah. the details? This is what we're here for. Otherwise, we don't believe you. You didn't show us the data. So different groups resonate with different communication styles. And I, I think that to go back to the uh, what you were saying about an academic style, I think even that is off, often misses the mark because I've seen so many scientists get up and try to give essentially a verbal, uh, an oral version of their paper, which is structured exactly the way you're talking about. You know, here's our premise, here's our apparatus, here's our experiment, here's our results, our data, our conclusions. And if they're doing that, say, in the middle of an academic conference uh, or scientific conference, who's gonna remember their data, their information, their thinking process once they've heard dozens of other similar presentations. I mean, don't you think that the key is to really engage your audience first, get them some, uh, and use that, that connection, that engagement to get your main point across so that they're motivated to learn more, to read your whole paper if, if that's where you want them to go? I mean. Even in an academic setting, I, I think we rely too much on the traditional uh, academic style of constructing a, a, a presentation as if it were a paper. What, what are your thoughts on that? The first question is, what's the goal by presenting? Mm -hmm. Now, it may just be my paper was accepted. I'm speaking at this conference. Check the box. One more check mark on the way to tenure. Right. And that, you don't care if there's two people in the audience or 200 because you check the box and that's fine. On the other hand, maybe this is trying to raise awareness of your project. In fact, you might know there are some people from NIH, from NASA, 
from DARPA who are in the audience, you're thinking, hey, I got to hit them up for funding for the follow-up. I need to sell it to them. So while obviously they know how to follow an academic talk if they're at this conference, still they're not pure academics. They do have a business sense. Maybe you throw in what are the bigger long-term implications because that's what those particular members of your audience want to see. Sure, include the academic stuff, it's an academic conference, mm -hmm. but recognize you might have different audiences. There's a scene in the documentary, We Crashed, which is all about Adam Newman and WeWork. And at one point he wants to get, I think this is how he is trying to get, I'm blanking on the name of it, uh, the big Japanese investor. And so he hears that there's a conference in India and he says, call them up, tell them, you know, the founder of WeWork, it was already a big name, tell them the founder of WeWork wants to speak at the conference. And he showed up and in the document, not documentary, it's, it's a documentary, but it's, uh, they take their own. A stats. docudrama? Not docudrama, thank you. Okay. In this show, he says, I went there for an audience of one person. He didn't care about everyone else in the room. He went there specifically to get in front of this person to help unlock the next round of funding. That was his goal. He didn't care if everyone else in the audience hated it. Now, you might not just say I care about one person, but it's important to understand who do you care about and what is it you want them to walk away from your talk with? Right, what difference the do you want to make to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other academics, maybe it's being cited. But for the funders, maybe it's convincing them that this will help them achieve their goals, whatever it might be. And so you want to know your audiences and their goals and communicate to them. To your other point, what can you do in a PowerPoint or oral presentation or just up on the stage that you can't do in a paper? Well, we know you can use more video or images. Maybe you have a slide or two of photos of you and all the grad students sitting there and toiling away on the <laughs> machine. And you explain how this was a difficult part or how much work you had to do here. And that's not something you put in the academic paper, but that works right. in a visual medium. You think, oh yeah, you know, I see them all in the hard hats. I see them toiling away. Oh, and that's going to make it more memorable. You were the guy with the slide with all those people. You had 50 people all in hard hats at the end of your project. Wow, that was a big team. You don't mention your team size when you're doing the paper. You only mention the people who are writing up the paper in the abstract. Right. So recognize different mediums can convey different information to potentially different audiences to get your message across. Understand the medium and the audience. Key points points um when you when you counsel these these students the undergraduate students whether they're going to go on into careers that are technical or uh more into other areas um is there a a common thread that you want to weave through for all of them that they're taking away from your course that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten or both the students in the class at mit and the companies I go and speak to, the key thing is that these skills can be learned in small steps. It can be overwhelming at times to think, oh my God, I am so down here at this low level. And my colleague, my manager, the CEO, this other person, she is just so incredible. I'm never going to be like that. Here's the thing small changes lead to long-term improvements. Mm, I'm, gonna use I'm interrupting only because I want to underscore what you just said. Small changes lead to long-term improvements. That's so important. I'm gonna use an analogy from one of the other chapters in my book. In my book, there's 10 chapters, the 10 skills that we see companies want. And one of them is on communication. It talks about some of the things we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. I have another one on negotiating. And that's another skill everyone says, oh, I wish I was better at. Consider the following. Imagine you're 30 years old. You have a job offer for $100,000. But instead of taking the job, you've learned to negotiate. Whether you read my book or a different book or took a class, learn to negotiate. You go and negotiate for $1,000 more. That's pretty small. We can imagine $1,000, 1%. 
takes you five minutes of a conversation or a few emails back and forth. So you take the job for 101,000. If you do nothing else for the rest of your career, you sit in that job for 30 years until you retire, five minutes of negotiating just got you $1,000 more for 30 years. In five minutes of work, you got $30,000. Now, of course, everyone's saying, yeah, but I'm not staying in that job for 30 years. And you're right. You will have other jobs, raises, promotions. You will negotiate for more than $1,000. And in fact, it's not just about cash. If you learn to negotiate, and I'm not talking about being the world's best negotiator, I'm talking about getting just a little bit better, you can imagine this would lead to tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars in increased lifetime earnings small changes compound and lead to big results. Now it's true, there are some people who are more natural negotiators, more natural communicators, more natural at any of these skills. There are also people who are more natural at playing the violin or basketball. But those of us who put the effort in, we can outpace those people if they're not making an effort. If they're not making an effort, right. Don't right. think these people are just so much better natural communicators. I was terrible. I used to look down at the floor and I would stammer and I wouldn't make eye contact. I couldn't project, but I put the work in and I got better. So small changes can lead over time to a large result. Small changes can lead to a large result. Yeah, that's, that's powerful. That really is. Um, you know, when we speak or coach or instruct people when we offer training we're we're trying to make a difference we hope that our audience on on leaving on exiting after our presentation or our conversation will do something different and as you say a small change right then can have a compounded effect but you also have an interesting way of helping to overcome that attrition that loss of, uh, of information once you uh, end your exposure to a book, a podcast like this, a conversation. Tell me a little bit about that. We create an app called Brain Bump. Here's what I found. Whenever you read a book, as soon as you finish the book, standard business book, self-help, self-improvement, it's okay, great tips. And to your point, you quickly forget. Even worse, you're getting the content in one location, but you need to apply it in another. So consider the tips in my book. I have a chapter on networking. You're going to read that sitting on your couch. When do you need the tips? Two months later, as you're about to walk into an event, that's when you want it. But you haven't used it since then. You've forgotten it. So you want access to those tips then and there. Or it might be you're trying to improve your communications. There's a whole bunch of things to remember. Now you don't want to say, oh, wait, wait, hold up. I'm going to go quickly pull up an idea before I reply to you. <laughs> you just need these ideas top of mind. Right. We know spaced repetition works, but no one's going to create flashcards for what they read. I take notes on books I read, but I don't even go back and look at them, let alone use flashcards. So we took this idea and combined the concepts of flashcards, daily affirmations, and book summaries and put it together. And it ties into my philosophy about the future of media. And this is a whole other thing we won't really get into. The future of media is about content delivery when and where people want it. Right. Books are books for historical reasons. So we take the key ideas in books, in podcasts, blogs, classes, talks, put it into an app in people's pockets. And then they can say, I need this advice now. I need that networking advice right before I walk in the room. I'm going to pull up the app and pull up those tips right now when and where I need it. Or you can set it to get that daily reminder. You don't even need to open the app. Each day you get a little push with, say, a communication reminder from this podcast. And it helps keep it top of mind that over time, the repeat exposure will have it sink in and help you communicate better. What an interesting idea. How long has that app been available? It's not even public yet. It is oh. on the app we put it out in the beginning of summer, summer of 2022, when we're recording this. And over the summer, we've been tweaking it. One thing with an app, and this is another example of communication. If you ever build an app, you've got about two clicks before the user gives up. 
the <laughs> app right. be intuitive. And if it doesn't do what they think after two clicks, they go, oh, this is too hard. So we've been really working on that UI to make it intuitive. And now that we've got that right and fixed some bugs, now as we're recording this end of the summer, we're in the process of adding more content. We've got about 17 pieces at the time of this recording. We'll continue to add. I think of it like a streaming service. They just keep adding new shows. We'll keep adding new content and it will continue to grow as the content has more tips and we add more content. We're going to publicly launch early in the fall, late September, early October. All right. Well, I'll be sure to watch for the public launch of that. That sounds very, very exciting. Brain bump, you said. Brain bump. It's currently on the Android and iPhone stores. Although iPhone, they make it hard to search. Mm. I don't know either way to tell you. <laughs> Okay. We'll give you a URL at the end of the podcast. Sure. Yeah, we can put that up uh, in, in, the, in the show notes. Uh, speaking of show notes, uh, it, it's about time to draw this fascinating conversation to a close. I'm so pleased that we had this chance to talk and uh, share some ideas with my audience. Um, how can they follow up with you? I'm going to give you two websites. The first for my book, if you go to thecareertoolkitbook.com, there, of course, you can see where to buy the book, Amazon, elsewhere. You can get in touch with me. I put out new articles every week, which you can follow. There is a free companion app for the book, which does what we talked about, but it's just focused on my book. There's also a number of free resources on the resources page, and that will have things that will help you go deeper into your career, into developing some of these skills. Some are on the page to download. Some are links to free resources online all of this at thecareertoolkitbook.com. Then for Brain Bump, if you go to cognoscomedia.com, it's Latin for I learn. I never <laughs> thought this would be a public URL. If I had, I would have picked Latin. But Cognosco Media, C-O-G-N-O-S-C-O media.com. And if you go there and click the Brain Bump link in the menu, it'll take you to a page that can take you to the Android and iPhone stores where you can download the free app. So cognoscomedia.com and thecareertoolkitbook.com. And to get in touch with you, they can go through thecareertoolkitbook.com. Either site, go to the contact page, it will get Either to me. Either site will get, get them to you. That's wonderful. And I'm sure that uh, if people who have questions for you will want to follow up with you in that way. So thank you for sharing that. And if anyone would like to follow up with me, there's always an open invitation for that. I've, I've changed the way I'm doing that over time. You can, of course, uh, at any time go to the home page of this webcast, The Power of Story and Science, and the simple URL for that is, is storyandscience.com. Storyandscience.com will take you to the home page of this program, which is a page on my website. You can explore that and find ways to contact me as well. And there's a more direct way that you can get my attention for a question you'd like to get answered or a conversation you'd like to have, and that is to go to Breakthrough with David. Dot com. Breakthroughwithdavid.com. That takes you right to my calendar, and you can schedule a half-hour breakthrough call about this, about any subject of this program or whatever else you'd like to talk to me about regarding the way you communicate your work. Because no engineering solution, no scientific advance ever changed the world until someone knew about it. Mark, thank you for being here today. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you again for having me on the show, and thank you to your audience. And we'll wrap that up with a final thank you to everyone who is part of the Story and Science community.